Hi everyone, in the race to develop powerful AI systems, less scrupulous groups might opt for dominance through espionage. One effective shortcut is to break into an AI lab's cyber infrastructure to steal the model weights, potentially saving billions compared to training a model from scratch. Therefore, as the capabilities of AI frontier models increase, so too must the cybersecurity practices of their developers. Keep watching to learn more. This video has three parts securing model weights, organizational security levels, and what labs should do. Part one, securing model weights. There are a lot of groups and organizations out there that would love to get their hands on powerful AI models because powerful systems grant powerful capabilities and they're only getting better. Some groups like well-funded AI labs are going after models by simply training them themselves, but there are definitely less responsible actors out there that would still like to get their hands on model weights. At the top of my list would be three groups, intelligence agencies from rival countries, criminal organizations, and researchers that are meant to be collaborators but are really trying to take the model and run with it. If you're one of those groups, the easiest way to get a functional frontier model is to simply steal the weights. Let someone else spend all the millions on hiring qualified researchers and all that GPU time. It could be comparatively very cheap to just perform a cyber attack or make use of your existing access to make off with the weights. So in this video, we're thinking about the question, what can organizations do to defend themselves? And what are the implications if someone does compromise the security of a leading AI lab? If this sounds far-fetched to you, you should know that there have already been two cases where a very powerful AI model was leaked, or rather its weights were leaked. The first is the Llama model, which was developed by Meta and shared widely with researchers until a researcher decided to take all those weights and publish them openly on the internet. This seems to have been the beginning of Meta pursuing an open source strategy and engaging a lot with their community, so it seems to have worked out well for them. But this is certainly a case where their security controls were insufficient to protect the weights. The second case is Mistral. A mystery model was uploaded to Hugging Face and somehow outperformed every other model out there except GPT-4. Eventually, the CEO of Mistral confirmed that it was an earlier version of their model that had been leaked. And to save face, since Mistral is an organization that's trying to be open source and friendly to the community, the CEO actually posted on the Hugging Face page saying, hey, missing attribution. Basically, if you're going to steal our model, at least say where it came from. And this Mistral model was also leaked through a collaborator that had been given access to some research preview. So again, that's the third group that I mentioned that has access and could really leak model weights. And it's a serious attack vector because it's already happened twice. So clearly, any AI lab hoping to keep its crown jewels secure in the future might have to make some changes to their security policies. And many of them are doing that. For example, Anthropic has greatly expanded the size of its security team. The problem is that increasing security often leads to a decrease increase in productivity because for security reasons, you end up introducing additional access checks and you end up prohibiting certain types of data transfer because they're riskier and so on. Simple example, for security, you probably don't want someone to download certain things onto their own machine, like model weights and certain code, but that can make it much harder for the developer to actually do their job. There are several contexts in which AI models would need protecting. Of course, during training, but also in a research environment, like during fine tuning and in public API deployment, but also in internal deployments for use within the company. What people focus on most is model training and in the research environment. But reducing productivity here could substantially slow the lab's progress. And as you know, the AI labs are all racing as quickly as possible to try to stay ahead of one another. So implementing security well in this environment is a difficult balancing act. The rest of this video is based mostly on a report that was published by RAND at the end of May of this year. The title is Securing AI Model Weights, Preventing Theft, and misuse of frontier models. It's a very thorough piece of research, and I had the good fortune to actually meet one of the authors, and we had a great discussion. The authors interviewed a lot of people, including those from top AI labs, so it's a great way to get some perspective into what they're thinking and what they're trying to do. Actually, this video is the first in a series that I'm planning to be about three videos long, but we'll see, a series about AI lab security. And we're starting with the real crux of the problem, the model weights. So let's get into it. Part two, 
organizational security levels. As is common practice in security for government policy documents, first they define five different levels of operational capacity, which is basically what attackers can do and what their resources are. And then they define five different security levels, which are basically the defenses that would be needed to take care of those five different categories of attackers. So let's start by talking about operational capacity or the capabilities of the attackers. OC level one is amateur attempts. They categorize it as a single novice individual who has a few days to spend and $1,000. This is basically the script kitty level or the people that are doing spray and prey attacks just attacking the whole internet at once and trying to see if they get any targets. OC2 is professional opportunistic efforts. They categorize this as a single but capable individual who is willing to spend several weeks on the hacking attempt and up to $10,000. I think this is the level that most smaller businesses and startups are usually concerning themselves with. OC3 is cybercrime syndicates and insider threats. Basically, it includes criminal groups with 10 capable individuals spending several months on the problem and up to $1 million. That's quite a lot of resources, and you can start to see how some businesses get hacked by ransomware even if they have seemingly good security controls. OC3 also includes insider attacks, which probably just have a single individual carrying them out, but because they have significant access already within the company, they can still be very damaging. OC3 is what most large companies try to protect themselves against, I think. But now it's starting to get really interesting. OC4 is an attacker who has basically the capabilities of a standard operation by a top intelligence agency. In such an agency, you might have 100 people working on the problem, spending up to a whole year and up to $10 million on their hacking attempt. I say hacking attempt, but of course it's an intelligence agency. They might try to physically infiltrate the system and do all kinds of other tricks. I think you can see where this is going, but OC5 is basically a top priority operation by the most cyber capable institutions in the world. This means the NSA and a handful of other intelligence agencies, including that of China. In this case, of course, you have up to 1,000 individuals who have expertise far beyond publicly known capabilities who are willing to spend years on the problem and a budget of up to $1 billion. These agencies, of course, can only do a handful of operations at this level at any given time. And it might sound crazy to spend that many resources on a single attack, but it actually does happen. For example, I would put the Stuxnet attack into this category. That's when the US and Israel worked together to sabotage Iran's nuclear program. The attack was very sophisticated, starting with leaving a USB key physically near the facility and doing some social engineering to hopping to more and more secure networks between different architectures and eventually overwriting the firmware on some embedded devices that were basically, I think, German manufactured centrifuges in a very subtle way to cause them to just not work right. That's the kind of thing that happens when you have an OC5 level attacker after you. Now it's time to talk quickly about the five different levels of defense, which are called security levels, SL1 through SL5. SL1 means defenses that are likely to thwart the amateur attempts the attackers that have OC1 level capability. And even this most basic level requires you to have password best practices, multi-factor authentication, device screen locking policies, and best effort encryption of model weights. But at least according to the experts surveyed in this report, if you do all those things, you should be safe from OC1 level attacks. In SL2, you're trying to defeat professional opportunistic attacks. To do that, you need to do things like store weights exclusively on servers and never on local devices, monitor weight copies across the organization's network, separate the work network from guest networks and any other levels that are less secure, keep an inventory of all the network devices so that you know when something unusual shows up, and run a bug bounty program. Remember I said that this is probably startup level security. So one would hope that AI labs have been doing all of these things for quite some time now. And to be honest, it's not that onerous for an organization with say more than 20 employees. But I bet it took OpenAI a long time to check all these checkboxes. In SL3, you're trying to defend yourself against criminal organizations and insider threats. The key thing here is to have a special software system to access the weights. Users can't just copy the data over SSH. And any code that accesses the weights has to minimize its attack surface and use only highly trusted third-party libraries. As Mark Dodd says, the attack surface is the vulnerability. Finding a bug there is just detail. In other words, if the organization is using a lot of software, 
that means that there's a lot of potential entry points to get at the model weights. All software has bugs. So the first thing you can do to make yourself less vulnerable is to actually use less software. You should also be doing automated anomaly detection, for example, intrusion detection on the network, ongoing penetration testing, where you hire a third party firm to try to hack into your systems and then fix any issues that they discover. And overall, treat the security of your supply chain with utmost importance. Where did you buy that laptop from? Where was that software created and who contributed to it? How do you know for sure that this update that's being downloaded hasn't been hijacked? This is the bar to which we should be holding larger companies. Companies like OpenAI, Anthropic, DeepMind, you should hope that they're implementing all of these measures. Unfortunately though, it's harder than it sounds to check all these checkboxes. And even if you did, you would still be vulnerable to more powerful attackers. SL4 is where we start to talk about operations by intelligence services. To defend against other countries who want to have access to your weights, you have to do a lot. Isolate weight storage completely. Prohibit any devices near the computers that are storing the weights. Undergo source code auditing when possible of any devices that are actually used in the storage system. Do adversarial output detection from your model in case the model itself can leak some clues about the weights. Perform testing on the integrity of employees and also on investors and anyone else in a position of influence. And most importantly, hire employees that have experience dealing with intelligence agencies because intelligence agencies have access to a lot of things that other attackers simply don't. Two quick examples. They have tons of zero days that they've discovered internally, which are attacks against software that nobody else in the world knows about, in theory. And they have the ability to do a lot of physical infiltration and physical operations as well. It's very hard to imagine an organization reaching this level, SL4, without some involvement from their own intelligence agency in whatever country that they're based in. This could just come in the form of advice, and or red team testing for the organization, or it could be a deeper integration. But regular companies simply don't have the resources to mount this kind of defense, not to mention the usability and productivity decreases of implementing this kind of isolation of the weights. It's really hard to imagine having a dynamic fine tuning environment and also having a public API to access these things if the weights have to be that isolated. But wait, there's more. Let's talk about SL5. This is where you have a system that could plausibly be claimed to thwart a top priority operation by one of the world's top cyber institutions. Remember, these are attackers that are spending up to $1 billion just to break into your systems. What could you possibly do to defend against this? Well, let's try. You'd have to have a completely isolated network for weights storage. Again, this might make many actual uses of the weights pretty much impossible, but going on. You'd have to make sure that any computations using the weights have random noise inserted and take a constant amount of time to execute in case someone gets close enough to the data center to detect electromagnetic emanations and slowly figure out the weights through a side channel attack. You would have to proactively search for zero days yourself internally and fix the issues so that an intelligence agency couldn't use those bugs themselves. You would have to prioritize security over availability to an insane degree. For example, let's say the network that stores the weights goes down and there's a production outage and the company is losing lots of money. Well, you still can't violate the security controls. You still can't take any devices near the network that aren't pre-approved because you have to be paranoid and assume that the outage might be caused by a malicious actor who is then trying to sneak in with their specially prepared device to steal your model weights. You have to choose this paranoia even over your profits, which again is something that any company can't really do. In fact, the report just flat out states that this SL5 level is just not possible right now, even with tons of collaboration with the intelligence agencies. So what should the labs actually do then? Part three what labs should do. As we discussed, an AI lab would probably have to achieve SL4 level security to defend itself against other countries trying to hack in and steal the weights, or even SL5 level security if the lab wanted to thwart the actions of the top cyber intelligence agencies out there. For example, the US, Israel, and China. And we've seen that SL5 may not really be possible, and even SL4 is a really huge lift. 
So what should the labs actually do? Basically, they can build defense in depth. Having different layers of security always helps, no matter how small. So they can do things like centralize all the weights, reduce the number of people that can access them, and harden the interfaces that they use to do that access, implement insider threat monitoring to check if any employees are actually rogue actors from an intelligence agency, engage third-party penetration testers for sure to start testing the security. You don't know how good it is until you try. And finally, start using confidential computing to secure the model weights during training and inference. I haven't mentioned confidential computing yet, and that's because I'm going to do another video just on that topic. It's more technical, but it basically means using hardware features to really lock down the computations. It seems inevitable as well that intelligence agencies will have to get involved. Unfortunately for the US though, the NSA has a pretty bad reputation in the business world. They have a habit of intentionally hiding known vulnerabilities. Again, any of these really sophisticated threat actors are probably going to do that, but their silence about vulnerabilities in US-based systems allowed other countries to find those same vulnerabilities and execute attacks. The NSA has also historically intentionally weakened cryptographic standards with similar results, enabling an unknown number of other governments to execute hacking operations. Not to mention how the NSA forced companies to disclose user data in ongoing surveillance taps. That was happening to most of the really large US tech companies. However, the most sophisticated attackers are all intelligence agencies. So no matter what the NSA's reputation is, companies are gonna need their expertise. Unless, well, my joke is that everybody should build data centers in Canada. The Canadian intelligence agencies like CSEC have a better reputation than the NSA. And in Quebec, there's tons of hydroelectric power and Ontario has the biggest nuclear power plant in the world. Someone asked me if physical bandwidth restrictions could help here. Like if you can limit the amount of data that's sent out of a data center, you have a bandwidth budget and once you use it up, you can't really use that data center anymore. Basically the idea is to restrict the bandwidth budget so that the model weights would be bigger than that. So you couldn't exfiltrate the model weights. And after your training run, you go and physically take one of the hard drives, then wipe all the others to reuse the data center for something else. I mean, this helps a little bit for maybe OC4 level attackers, but there's tons of possible side channels out there. You could compress the weights before exfiltration, or you could just send someone yourself to go physically grab that hard drive that actually has the weights on it. We aren't here yet, but what would be great is to have some hardware whose sole purpose is to actually secure model weights. Something analogous to the hardware security tokens that we sometimes use for two-factor authentication. Those devices have cryptographic keys burned into the hardware in a way that's really hard to read and extract. But overall, I have to say that things don't look good for the AI labs being able to maintain a tight lid on all their model weights. It might just be very difficult to maintain a closed source AI model going into the future, which has some pretty negative implications. Like what are we gonna do about AI safety when the most powerful models in the world are just out there for anyone to see? I guess the future will be interesting. Finally, in conclusion, this was the first video in a series about how AI labs can or should improve their security. We talked about a report from RAND titled Securing AI Model Weights, which queried lots of experts to define five levels of different attacker capabilities and five levels of defenses needed to defeat those attackers. It turns out that the most powerful attackers, especially OC4 and OC5, are really, really difficult to defend against. And it's probably beyond the capabilities of any company. Possibly a company in partnership with an intelligence agency could get more done. But it's hard to see that happening right now, at least not without the US nationalizing a bunch of AI model development. Maybe Leopold Aschenbrenner was right after all? I guess we'll see. If you liked this video, check out this previous one I made about the $100 billion Stargate data center being built by Microsoft. All right, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.